Oklahoma Girl Scout Murders. It was summer of 1977, and camp season was about to begin for children across the United States. Camp Scott, located in northeastern Oklahoma in Mays County, had been a retreat for Girl Scouts since 1928. Its 410 wooded acres could accommodate 140 campers and up to 30 staff members. A road nicknamed Cookie Trail led to 10 camping units scattered throughout the verdant beauty of the forest. In April of 1977, just two months before camp was about to start, a summer camp counselor attending a group training session discovered that an unknown person had broken into her cabin and had gone through her personal belongings. Strangely enough, the only thing missing was all of her donuts out of their box. In their place was a hastily scrawled note that read, in part, We are on a mission to kill three girls in Tent 1. A fake body was also found hanging on the property. This incident and the accompanying note was disregarded as the message also made mention of Martians, and therefore the whole affair was seen as a prank. The management at Camp Scott made a decision many later called foolish when they failed to disclose the so-called prank to parents of the children slated to attend the upcoming summer sessions. Tent 1 stayed within the tent rotation and was assigned per the usual procedures. On Sunday, June 12, 1977, three young girls, Lori Lee Farmer, age 8, Michelle Heather Goose, age 9, and Doris Denise Milner, nicknamed Denise, age 10, bounded joyfully onto the bus that would take them along with 137 other campers to Camp Scott. The large group of preteen campers were set to spend a fun and eventful two weeks at the camp, but for three random girls, their trip would be tragically cut short. Upon arrival, the girls were all assigned campsites and tents. The camp was split into 10 different units, within which there were around seven tents for campers as well as the counselor's tent. Each campsite had a Native American tribe's name, and Lori, Denise, and Michelle were assigned to the Kiowa campsite, Tent 8. There were 27 Girl Scouts in Kiowa unit, and they were split into seven different tents. Tent number eight was located on the edge of the campsite and geographically the farthest from the camp counselor's tent, which was some 150 yards away and hidden behind the forest's mass of trees and foliage. The trio was actually supposed to be a quartet, as a fourth girl was also set to be in tent eight that night, but due to a clerical error, she had been misassigned. The unnamed fourth girl was meant to be moved to Tent 8 that very evening, but due to an impending thunderstorm, the camp counselors decided to postpone the move, thus unknowingly saving that girl's life. At 7pm the night of June 12th, the storm was in full force, but the girls were warm and happy, acquainting themselves over dinner in the dining tent. After eating, they, along with the rest of the brood, walked to their tents to retire for the night. That evening, after returning to their tent from dinner, the girls wrote letters to their families at home. Nine-year-old Michelle writes, Dear Aunt Karen, how are you? I am fine. I am writing from camp. We can't go outside because it is storming. Me and my tentmates are in the last tent in our unit. My tentmates are Denise Milner and Lori Farmer. My room is shades of purple. Love, Michelle. Lori writes to her family in part, We're just getting ready to go to bed. It is 7.45. I couldn't wait to write. We're all writing letters now because there's nothing else to do. But it is perhaps Denise's letter that seems the most haunting as she was already uneasy about her impending two-week stay. I don't like camp. It's awful, she writes. Mom, I don't want to stay at camp for two weeks. I want to come home and see Cassie and everybody. These letters would be the last written words of these precious and innocent girls. Carla Wilhite, a university student working at the camp, later testified that around 1.30 a.m. in the early morning of June 13th, she heard what she described as guttural moaning sounds at a cross-section of trails leading towards the showers. 
She swept her flashlight across the campsite as the noise started up again, but, seeing nothing out of the usual, returned to her tent without alerting anybody else. She later explained that she assumed it was an animal and made the choice not to tell her co-workers because she thought they would be annoyed at having to walk through the cold, damp, dark forest and would think she was not up to the job of being a camp counselor. This choice, she says, would haunt her for the rest of her life. Others at the campsite that night later reported seeing a flashlight bobbing through the woods and also recalled hearing moaning or groaning sounds. At around 2 a.m., a girl in Tent 7 recalls the tent flap opening and a figure with a flashlight standing in the entryway. The girl was one of four campers in that tent and the only one awake at the time. She watched silently as the figure regarded the group for a second before closing the tent flap and walking off. The camper was confused and simply went back to sleep without alerting anyone. Between 2.30 and 3 a.m., a nearby landowner later reported hearing a great deal of automobile traffic on his remote road near the camp. At 3 a.m., a girl in a neighboring campsite, the Cherokee Camp, heard a scream. She recalls looking at her watch and waking up another girl. They listened for more noises and upon hearing none, went back to sleep. At roughly the same time, another girl from another campsite says she heard screams and someone crying, Mama, Mama. She, unsure of what to do, did nothing and went back to sleep. At 6 a.m. the next morning, Carla Wilhite, the same camp counselor who had heard the strange sounds in the night, was jogging the path towards the same cross-section of trails that led to the camp showers which was the same location of the strange noises she had heard the night before. Under some trees, she spotted three sleeping bags. Thinking it was leftover luggage from the new campers, dropped off the day prior, she began to make her way towards it. Then, she saw a body. It was the ten-year-old body of Doris Denise Milner. Carla's screams first alerted the other camp counselors to the gruesome scene, and quickly a crowd gathered. Upon seeing Denise dead, beaten, bound, and partially nude, the counselors were too fearful to open the other two closed sleeping bags, and police didn't even realize that there were three victims until authorities arrived on scene and a coroner opened the two zipped sleeping bags. Authorities would testify that the other two girls, Lori and Michelle, were both bound with elastic bands in their respective sleeping bags both in fetal positions and wrapped in bloodied bed sheets. Both girls had died of blunt force trauma to the backs of their heads, seemingly while they were still sleeping inside the tent. Denise, however, detectives surmised, had been led away from the tent still alive. Evidence showed Denise was sexually assaulted and beaten so hard in the face that indentations of the weapon remained as post-mortem artifacts although her cause of death is listed as strangulation. There was blood on the floor of the tent, indicating the girls had initially been attacked inside and then were carried outside. Evidence found on scene included a large flashlight, red in color, with a single fingerprint on the lens that, while able to be dusted, imaged, and scanned, never returned any matches in any state or federal databases. A footprint left in the pool of blood in the tent was also found, made by a male size nine and a half shoe. Along with these items, there was also a rope, duct tape, and a long black hair. Authorities began their tedious and emotionally charged investigation surrounding the camp with emergency vehicles. Parents were informed that something had gone wrong and that they would have to pick up their children at the council building. Parents of all 140 campers rightfully panicked and drove to the camp, creating a literal mile-long line of cars backing up into the entrance road, known as Cookie Trail, so named for the Girl Scouts' most famous annual endeavor. Frantic parents were turned away and forced to wait hours in the sun as the camp was put on lockdown. Terrified parents who saw the emergency vehicles and heard rumors were not told of their camper's status. The rest of the Girl Scouts themselves were not told that three of their campmates were dead. They were taken to participate in activities away from the campsite until the buses arrived to take them back to the Magic Empire Council in Tulsa. 
The camp was eventually evacuated entirely, and campers were released to their parents or guardians, with some being released without even their luggage, and all of them confused at the purpose of their trip being cut so short. June 13th would be the last day Camp Scott ever operated. The camp would close for good. The investigation went into full swing once the camp was cleared out. The following day, June 14th, detectives noted that it appeared the murderer had attempted to clean up the blood and smeared it around in the process. There was blood not only on the floor, but also on the towels and the mattresses. The investigators soon learned about Jack Schroff, who owned a ranch near Camp Scott. At his home, black duct tape was found, as well as rope, which appeared identical to that which had been used to bind the wrists of two of the girls. However, Schroff claimed that his house had been broken into prior to the attack. Some items had been stolen from his cabin, but he could not name exactly what had been taken. Schroff took a polygraph and passed. He also had a solid alibi for the night of the murders and therefore was cleared as a suspect. Authorities then came up with a new suspect named Jean Leroy Hart. Jean Leroy Hart was a local Cherokee man. Raised just one mile from Camp Scott, he had been at large for four years, since 1973, when he escaped the Mays County Jail, of which he was an inmate for the crime of kidnapping and the subsequent rape of two pregnant women, as well as four counts of burglary. Although there is no direct evidence linking Hart to the crime, the sheriff in town, Weaver, said that he believed Hart was, quote, 1,000% guilty, but he did not elaborate as to why he believed that. Several days after the murders, some hunters discovered a cave which appeared inhabited. They found a number of items in the cave, including women's glasses, pages from the Tulsa newspaper, a section of which had been found in the battery compartment of the flashlight, possibly to keep the batteries from rattling around, and photographs that Hart himself had developed while working in the photo lab at the Granite Reformery. Perhaps the most tantalizing clue found in the cave was a note written on the wall which read, 77617, the real killer was here, bye bye fools. Nearly one year after the crime, Hart was picked up at the home of a Cherokee man by the name of Pigeon and arrested on suspicion of the brutal assault and murders. Investigators searched the residence of Pigeon, but did not find anything related to the case. They searched again, and this time they found items that the camp counselor claimed had gone missing before camp began. Pigeon claimed these items were never there and that they had been planted in his home. There was also speculation that Sheriff Weaver actually had the photos which belonged to Hart in his desk at the Mays County Jail and planted them in the cave, therefore tying Hart to the case. Many family and area residents believed Hart was innocent, they raised money for his defense and supported him during his trial. A key piece of evidence was the long black hair, which was found on one of the victims. A state crime analyst said that although the hair matched Hart's hair, you could not identify a person based on hair alone at that time in 1977. The fingerprint on the flashlight lens did not match that of Hart. The bloody footprint in the tent was also too small to be Hart's. A jury eventually found Hart acquitted of all charges, and when they pronounced that verdict, Hart began openly sobbing with relief. He maintained his innocence. The not guilty verdict notwithstanding, Hart still had a 306-year state prison sentence for the crimes he was originally convicted of, as well as the successful prison escape. However, after just two months back in jail, Hart had a massive heart attack and died instantly at age 35. The parents of Doris Denise and Lori Farmer, but not those of Michelle, sued the Magic Empire Council of Girl Scouts for $5 million, alleging that the organization's administrators and the adults in charge were negligent. They included complaints regarding the threatening note left in the donut box two months prior to the tragedy, as well as the lack of adequate supervision of the campers and lack of follow-up in regards to the noises made that night. One of the campers who heard sounds in the night, though it is unclear which camper, says she told the camp counselor of these screams and was told to ignore them. 
In their defense, the camp counselors explained that first nights at camp are often filled with girls gleefully screeching and getting to know one another. In 2008, bodily fluids from inside the tent were put forward for DNA testing with more advanced forensic technology analysis. No answers came from this, however, due to the deterioration of the samples being too great. No other viable suspect ever surfaced, and the case remains open and unsolved to this day. Evansdale Murders Lyric Ray Lynn Cook was born on October 2, 2001, in Waterloo, Iowa, to Dan and Misty Morrissey. Lyric also had a brother named Dylan, whom she was very close to. Both of Lyric's parents struggled with drug abuse, and Lyric was mostly raised by her grandmother, Wilma Cook. Lyric attended Kingsley Elementary School in Waterloo. She enjoyed playing outside, bowling, cheerleading, and gymnastics. Lyric was described as a special young lady who was an infectious joy to be around. She had a heart of compassion for her family and her friends. She also enjoyed playing card games with her grandmother in the afternoon. Elizabeth June Marie Collins was born at Allen Memorial Hospital in Waterloo, Iowa on July 3, 2003 to Drew and Heather Collins. Elizabeth grew up with three siblings, one brother named Kelly and two sisters named Amber and Callie. She loved playing with her siblings and ordering them around. Elizabeth had a bubbly personality and enjoyed dressing up and getting her nails and hair done. She loved singing, riding her bike, and playing softball and hockey. She was a student at Pointer Elementary School in Evansdale. She also had a dog named Gus that she loved, and both had grown inseparable. Lyric's mother, Misty, and Elizabeth's mother, Heather, are sisters. And as cousins, Lyric and Elizabeth often played together, especially since Lyric ended up spending a lot of time with her grandmother. During the summer holidays of 2012, Lyric and Elizabeth were spending a lot of time together at their grandmother, Wilma's house, where they often played cards and rode their bicycles together. On the 13th of July, 2012, Lyric and Elizabeth were on one such bicycle ride around Evansdale. The girl's grandmother saw the girls riding their bike at around 12.15 p.m. near downtown Evansdale. The girls were seen at about 12.23 on Broven Boulevard in Evansdale, and then spotted between 12.30 and 1 p.m. on Gilbert Drive, which was about one and a half miles from their grandmother's house. The area was not far from Myers Lake, a popular fishing and recreational area. This was the last time they were seen alive. About two hours later, when the girls didn't return to their grandmother's house, the family members began looking around, calling friends and family to figure out if they had seen the girls. When they were nowhere to be found, the family notified the police at 2.48 p.m. Evansdale police began canvassing the area, and hundreds of volunteers from the community helped search for the missing cousins. Black Hawk sheriffs and the local fire department also joined in to search for the missing girls. At 4 p.m., the bikes belonging to Lyric and Elizabeth were found by local firefighters on a trail on the southeast corner of Myers Lake. Elizabeth's purse, which had a cell phone in it, was also found about 25 feet away, just on the other side of a fence, but Lyric and Elizabeth were nowhere to be found. The cell phone was used by the girls to play games and was not activated to make phone calls. When the bicycles were found, it became apparent that the girls were in imminent danger and that time was of the essence. Flyers were posted around the community, pleading for the children's safe return. The police officers ramped up their search and called in divers with Cedar Valley Underwater Search and Rescue to help search Myers Lake. Officers slowly paddled around the lake in kayaks. A group of three officers walking along the southeast shoreline found a cup. An officer with gloves and an evidence bag picked it up and took it back to a patrol car sitting along the bank. Officials didn't identify the object or even confirm whether it was related to the search. After several days of setback, the lake was partially drained, but they failed to find anything. Agents from FBI's Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Team were also called in for the search. Meanwhile, volunteers, searchers, and sniffer dogs searched around the lake and trails. Police even followed the sanitation crews as they collected trash throughout the community. However, nothing came of it. The police conducted hundreds of interviews and retrieved footage from security cameras. 
The girls were seen on one security footage obtained from an auction house in an alley located a short distance away from their grandmother's house. Soon, a tip line turned up numerous reports of articles of clothing that had been found, but none belonged to the girls. Tips came from across the United States as it gained national attention. The police began to question registered sex offenders and anyone recently arrested for the abuse or enticement of a minor in the area. Many of them were interviewed several times and were even asked to take a polygraph test. Unfortunately, all of them were cleared. The family and friends of the girls were also questioned and interviewed. The family members agreed to have their phones and personal computers taken for examination, but there was no sign of any suspicious activity and all of them were cleared. Within the next few months, police began investigating Lyric's parents, Dan and Misty, although they did say they were not suspects in the disappearance. Dan and Misty were divorced, but both parents had a history of drug abuse, and her father had a history of making drugs in the house while the children were home, including the day they disappeared. Dan specifically had numerous charges going back to the 1990s, which included crimes from burglary to possession and distribution of methamphetamines in large quantities. Not long before the girls vanished, Dan was also charged with physical assault on Misty, and at the time of the girls' disappearance, he had a restraining order against him, preventing him from contacting Misty. Dan was scheduled in court to testify against people he had meth deals with shortly after the girls' disappearance. At the time, Dan had pending cases against him, charging him with possessing, dealing, and making methamphetamine, and a range of other drug charges that could lock him up for decades if convicted. A year and a half after the girls went missing, Dan was sentenced to 90 years in prison for drug charges. Misty also had a checkered past and was convicted in 2014 for several crimes, which included excessive alcohol and drug-related offenses. She only served a short time in prison and would be released a year later. Despite their offenses, both parents maintained they had nothing to do with the girls' disappearances. Despite extensive investigation, no new update would be received for months. Then, on December 5, 2012, hunters came across two deceased bodies in the Seven Bridges Wildlife Park near Reedland in Bremer County, a wildlife area about 25 miles from where the girls were last seen. They contacted law enforcement officials at 12.45 p.m. The next day, Chief Deputy Rick Abin with the Black Hawk County Sheriff's Office held a press conference to announce officials were confident that the bodies were those of Lyric and Elizabeth. Abin said there were no other missing persons cases and the remains found were of a smaller statue. The bodies were transported to the state medical examiner's office in Ankeny for a positive identification. On December 10, 2012, the Iowa State Medical Examiner's Office confirmed the bodies found were those of Lyric Cook and Elizabeth Collins. On February 6, 2013, officials announced that the trail and park at Myers Lake would be renamed to honor the memory of Lyric and Elizabeth. The trail that runs around the lake is now known as the Trail of Angels. The park next to the lake will also be known as Angels Park. The city also declared July 13th as Lyric and Elizabeth Day. According to the police, the area where the bodies were found was very isolated and not many people knew about it, suggesting that the perpetrator was familiar with the park. Authorities would never reveal the cause of death of the girls and other crucial information relating to the murder. This is usually done to help avoid false confessions, which actually did happen in this case. In 2012, the police would receive two separate confessions claiming to be the killer. The authorities, however, were able to quickly rule them out as they were not able to share any information that wasn't already revealed to the public. On June 24, 2013, six months after their bodies were found, authorities announced that they had three different witnesses who told police they saw a white, full-sized, older model SUV, similar to a Chevy Suburban or Ford Bronco, parked on Arbutus Avenue on July 13, the day the girls vanished. Arbutus Avenue meets the bike trail where the girls' bicycles were located. The vehicle was described as a large and clunky white SUV and an old-style boxy Suburban. Two of the witnesses had reported seeing this white SUV parked between the bike trail signs. The other witness told police that they saw the vehicle parked near the woods on the east side of the lake, which was only a few hundred feet away from where the bikes were found. All three witnesses say they'd seen the SUV sometime between 11.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. 
there was some criticism as to why police didn't reveal the vehicle information sooner. It was found that while two witnesses came forward during the initial canvassing of the area, the third witness would come forward almost a year later because they assumed someone had already told police and that police just didn't know if the information was of any significance at the time. After the third witness came forward, the police forwarded this tip to the media and asked for anyone with information to come forward. Around the same time, on May 20th, 2013, Kathleen Shepard and Desi Hughes were walking home from their school when they were lured into a pickup truck by a man. The man drove the girls around in his truck for some time before he took them to a hog confinement site where he zip-tied their hands together. The man then took Kathleen to another part of the property. When he left, Desi was able to escape and went for help. When the police arrived at the scene, they located his truck and found him dead inside. He had taken his own life. There were, however, no signs of Kathleen. Hundreds of police officers and volunteers scoured the network of rural roads and trails in the search for the 15-year-old, deploying aircrafts and sniffer dogs. Kathleen's body would be found a few weeks later, on June 7, 2013, in the Des Moines River, about 20 miles downriver from the pig farm. She had been stabbed and beaten to death. The police quickly identified the kidnapper as Michael Clender, a registered sex offender from Stratford, Iowa. Clender had spent years in and out of prison, including time served for a 1991 conviction on charges that he kidnapped and assaulted a woman and kidnapped two three-year-olds. Luckily, all of the victims had survived. The abduction came less than a year after the disappearance of Lyric and Elizabeth Cook, and less than 100 miles from Evansdale. Moreover, Clunder had recently been released from prison in 2011. All of this led police to wonder if Clunder had anything to do with Lyric and Elizabeth's murders. However, on May 14, 2014, police pretty confidently said that Michael Clunder was no longer a person of interest in the Lyric and Elizabeth case. In July of 2017, a 58-year-old man named Jeff Altmaier was arrested when he tried to lure away two elementary school girls while they were returning from school. It was found that he had been enticing children all over Iowa, in Onawa, Jasper, and Grundy counties. In fact, in 2016, Jeff had attempted to lure dozens of children into his car. He was also a suspect in at least two other cases of assault on underage girls. He would later be sentenced to life in prison for these crimes. Police investigated him as a potential lead in the Evansdale murders, but so far there is no evidence linking him to the crimes. Jeff is still a person of interest in the Evansdale murders. In 2018, 36-year-old Teresa Gerleman crossed the train tracks with her 8-year-old son as the train approached, but then returned to the center of the tracks as the train drew near and pulled her son onto the tracks at the last moment killing both of them instantly. Police at first thought it was a tragic accident, but after checking the CCTV footage and talking to Teresa's friends, police realized it was a murder-suicide. During their investigations, police found out that Teresa had told her community support specialists at Genesis Development, Julie Croft and Belle Plain, that she had kept a six-page letter in a box in her house. The letter was written by the men who had supposedly killed Lyric Cook and Elizabeth Collins. Teresa said she used to hang around with these men and that they had admitted to the crime. Investigators executed a search warrant, taking several items from Teresa's home. Other items found while executing the search warrant included four cell phones, two notebooks, and two sealed envelopes that said, To Jeremiah from Henry and To Phaedra from Henry. Teresa's son was named Henry. They also found a six-page letter, but it did not contain any additional information that Julie hadn't already told them about. Teresa also told Julie that her medications made her feel like standing in front of a train about three months ago. During the investigation, authorities also found that she didn't have much for immediate family. Both her parents were deceased and she had no siblings. Police believe that Teresa's mental health probably made it hard for her to differentiate what was real and what was not. It is unknown if Teresa and her son's death were linked to the Evansdale murders. Over the last few years, some have speculated that Lyric and Elizabeth's murders might be related to the February 2017 murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German in Delphi, Indiana. There were some similarities in the two murders, but police have since ruled out any connection between the two murders. 
The Evansdale Police Department has said that the perpetrator is likely to be local, and the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, the BAU, has analyzed the case and believe that one person is responsible for the abduction and murders and released an outline of the offender's profile. The offender is believed to be familiar with both Myers Lake and Seven Bridges Wildlife Area in Bremer County. The offender selected Seven Bridges because he was familiar with how secluded the area is. The offender blends in with and maybe is part of the Evansdale, Bremer, and surrounding communities. The perpetrator most likely used quiet coercion to gain compliance, such as a ruse or threats of violence to get the girls to leave with him. During July 2012, the perpetrator may have been experiencing stress due to spousal problems, financial difficulties, legal trouble, employment difficulties, or mental health issues. The offender may avoid discussing the case or may show interest in following media developments. The offender may not have abducted or attempted to abduct other children or adults in the past. Following the disappearance, the suspect may have changed their appearance, hairstyle, or facial hair. The offender's vehicle may have been hidden or suddenly sold, altered with a new paint job, or the interior reupholstered. Police have investigated more than 1,000 leads and interviewed over 300 offenders, but the case still remains unsolved. If you have any information about the murders of Lyric and Elizabeth, please contact the authorities. Amy Mihaljevich. Born on December 11th, 1978, 10-year-old Amy Mihaljevic brought joy to everyone in her life. Growing up in a quiet town called Bay Village in Ohio, located to the north of Cleveland suburbs near Lake Erie, Amy was described as outgoing, clever, and kind. She was in the gifted program at her school, and some recall that she was more outgoing and comfortable around adults than most girls her age. She wore a cross on a chain around her neck and loved horses and horseback riding. She liked to wear her hair in a side ponytail, and when she smiled, relatives recall her freckles caught in the sun like twinkling stars. Her mother worked full-time at Trading Times Magazine, a classified publication which advertised car sales. October 27th was a cool and calm Friday in 1989. It was the kind of day of which autumn memories are made. Locals recall that the days leading up to Halloween were always full of anticipation and quiet excitement in that all-American small town, and this year was no exception, with preparations being made for parties and parades. But while parents and kids geared up to face the haunts and horrors of trick-or-treating after dark, a far more cunning and deceptive danger was in fact lurking in broad daylight. fifth grader left her house at around 7.20 a.m. that morning, telling her mom she would be home late due to a fifth grade choir audition. She rode her bike to school alone, her older brother Jason having left earlier. This was a common and everyday occurrence in this small community in 1989, and Amy joined dozens of other school children at the bike racks in front of Bay Village Middle School as she prepared to start her day. In school, Amy watched a presentation by local police alongside her peers. The topic? Stranger danger. Little did the presenting police officer know that one audience member was only moments away from her own stranger abduction, as hours later the actual reality of the danger of strangers would be revealed to Amy in the cruelest of fashions. School got out at 2.04 p.m. that day. Amy left her bike in the school's bike rack and walked with her two friends to the nearby Bay Village Square, an open-plan shopping center just one block from their school that was typically busy at that time. Amy had previously told her mom that there was a choir audition happening and explained that she would not be home until later in the evening because of it. 
but there is no written record of any choir audition ever taking place that day, and police believe that this was a cover story for what Amy thought was going to be a wonderful and well-intentioned surprise for her mother. It was the children's responsibility to get themselves home every day, and they were then to call their mother to let her know that they arrived. At 3.10 that afternoon, Amy's older brother, Jason, called his mother to tell her that while he had arrived home, Amy was yet to show up. In what is incredibly strange and confusing, Amy's mom then states that Amy herself called her at work at 3.30 p.m. and told her mom that everything was fine. The generic nature of that verbal communication was misunderstood by Amy's mother as confirmation that Amy was in fact home safe. As caller ID was not available back in 1989, Amy's mother had no way of knowing the origination of that call, but assumed, incorrectly, that it had come from their home. No other details have been publicly provided about that phone call, and such uncertainty surrounding the details of the call and its origins haunt investigators and relatives alike. Police now believe that Amy's abductor allowed her to call her mother's work in order to throw off suspicions for another few hours. Going about the remainder of her workday unalarmed, Margaret Maholovic did not realize her assumptions about Amy arriving home had been woefully incorrect until she got off of work and drove home that evening. When Amy's mother got off of work at 5.30 and drove back to her house, she was panicked to find that Amy had actually never returned home that day. Amy's mother quickly called the parents of Amy's friends and then went to the school where she saw Amy's bike, which she took to and from school each day, still in the bike rack. At 5.58 p.m., three hours and 45 minutes since Amy had last been seen and just two and a half hours since she had called her mom from an unknown location, Amy's mother contacted police and filed a missing persons report. Due to the age of the missing child, all available police units were dispatched to the area and the FBI was called in to assist. At this point, no one knew about the phone call Amy had received prior to her abduction, inviting her to go shopping for a secret present for her mother. What had previously seemed like just a mundane and unremarkable interaction suddenly became highly important when police canvassed the shopping mall and discovered that there were some people who recalled seeing the 10-year-old with an older man. They were able to describe the older male to some extent as well as the car that he ultimately led Amy to. Amy was last seen outside of Baskin Robbins ice cream store with the man described by her two schoolmates as looking like he could have been Amy's father. They remembered the man as having dark hair and recall that he may have been balding. One adult witness, the owner of a shop located behind the ice cream parlor, recalls seeing Amy being picked up by a man that he described as Caucasian and who he estimated as being between the ages of 35 and 45 years old. The witness estimated the man's height at around 5 foot 8 and said he had an average build and dark hair. The witness also recalls that the suspect was possibly wearing a tan jacket and may have had glasses. Another witness provides an even more specific recollection, recalling that the man who spoke to Amy was wearing a beige windbreaker with plaid patterned inner lining and front pressed tan khakis paired with a button up shirt. The witness remembers that the man's hair was thick and bushy and brushed the tops of his eyebrows in length. The adult witness also brings up that while the man wasn't dressed in an unprofessional way, he had poor posture and didn't carry himself with professionalism or distinction, like a professional white collar worker might when in public. The witness recalls that the man walked directly up to Amy, stooped over to speak with her for a moment, and then led her away to his car. This is estimated to have happened between 2.20 and 2.30 p.m. While police canvassed the neighborhood and interviewed hundreds of potential witnesses, the only viable lead they had was that Amy had received a phone call inviting her on a clandestine shopping trip in broad daylight for her mother. Amy's friends recall her telling them that the man on the phone had told her that she was good at keeping secrets and that her mom had received a promotion. Tragically, three months later, on February 8, 1990, Amy's body was found in farmland off of County Road 1181. 50 miles from the Bay Village Square Shopping Center, police believe her body was placed in that location shortly after her abduction. 
While Amy's location was finally known, the pain experienced by her family was not at all lessened, as while they had hoped she would be found alive, they had almost relegated themselves to the fact that she was gone. But they never imagined she would have been taken from them in such a brutal fashion, indicative of a true monster living in their midst. Investigators revealed that Amy had unfortunately been stabbed twice in the neck, but not before being sexually assaulted. While her body was clothed, she was missing some items that she would have been carrying with her that day. Police believe her killer took items from her as souvenirs of sorts, including her horse riding boots, her denim backpack, her binder, which had Buick Best in Class written on the front clasp, and turquoise earrings, which were in the shape of horse heads. A very small amount of DNA was able to be recovered from the crime scene, which was not necessarily the scene of the crime. That is to say, detectives do not believe that Amy was killed in the same location that her body was left. The DNA collected was never matched to anybody within Amy's family or any of her known associates. According to various news sources, the DNA recovered was in the form of a piece of tape containing three hairs, not necessarily all from the same person. The hairs that were found were without the hair follicle present. This means that the hair found was not pulled from the root, and therefore it does not have the type of DNA that is easily traceable in CODIS, but rather mitochondrial DNA, of which, with further analysis, it could be compared to a suspect, but could not be inputted into the CODIS system as a fluid or other nucleus-based DNA sample would. Amy's body was also found with gold or tan fibers present on her person. Media sources vary on the color, with some saying gold and some saying tan. In 2006, police would reveal that at least three other young girls had been telephoned by an adult male and had been told similar stories of a relative getting a promotion. These girls were also given an invitation to purchase a gift, in secret, for that relative, but none of them accepted. Looking at the pattern of those contacted, Amy reportedly was one of many girls who visited the Holly Hill Farm and Horse Stables, as well as Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in Bay Village. There is a theory that Amy was one of many young girls who signed a logbook listing her full name and phone number in the process. There is speculation that an unnamed volunteer, possibly at the Science Center, could be connected. And James Renner, author of a book on the case, states that while the museum supposedly has copies of that logbook, he theorizes that they are suppressing the release of such documents out of fear of negative press. The Freedom of Information Act does not apply to private foundations, so unless someone from the museum's board requests a review of the documents, no more information on the visitor logbooks can be uncovered. Until 2006, it was not public knowledge that other girls had been called, nor that there was a possible connection to the stables or the science museum. While this seemed like a major break in the case, the public heard nothing more on the logbook, and the subject was dropped after the initial press release. In 2016, police released crucial information regarding a blanket and a curtain that was recovered back in 1990 near County Road 1181. Initially, when Amy's body was found three months after her abduction, detectives collected all the items in the crime scene's vicinity, from trash to various personal belongings, and these two items were found together, about 1,000 feet from Amy's body. At first, there was thought to be no direct connection between Amy and the blanket and curtain, so the evidence was not disclosed to the media, and the public was never asked for their assistance. However, once technology allowed for it, the animal hairs that were clinging to the blanket were finally able to be analyzed for DNA, and the hairs were conclusively matched to Jake, the family dog, to whom Amy was close. The two items that have been linked to Amy are a homemade curtain, described as being avocado green in color, and a store-bought, light-colored blanket. Some questions which came from this new discovery surrounded how Amy's killer had acquired those items. 
with some wondering if the killer had possibly taken them from a previous encounter because Amy's mother never mentioned that she'd carried any bags when she rode her bike to school at 7.20 a.m. that morning. FBI agent Phil Torsney, who returned from retirement just to work on Amy's case, says of the two items, quote, if we can find the person who, somebody can call us and say, my mom made this curtain, my grandma made this curtain, it was hanging in my brother's room, whatever that is, we can solve the case. In January of 2019, police received a call from a now 64-year-old man's ex-girlfriend who claimed that the evening that Amy went missing, Friday, October 27th, 1989, her then-boyfriend did not come home. The woman stated that back when she and the unnamed male lived within a mile of the shopping center from which Amy was kidnapped, not only did the unnamed suspect work and have family in that area, but he also had a niece in the exact same grade as Amy, the fifth grade. The belated witness shared with police that she believed her ex-boyfriend was possibly responsible for Amy's kidnapping and subsequent murder because he strangely left work that afternoon but never came home that night, which was highly unusual for him. But the suspicious circumstantial evidence does not stop there and only continued to pile up. After receiving this tip, detectives quickly noticed that when comparing the scene's artifacts to what they knew about the new suspect. Based on DMV records, in 1989, he owned a gold-colored Oldsmobile with tan interior. If the description of the gold color and specific auto make of the car, which matched witness descriptions of the car that they saw Amy getting into that fateful day, wasn't enough, the tan or gold fibers found on Amy's body that day matched the color of the description of the interior of the Oldsmobile, registered to the suspect back in 1989 and 1990. The ex-girlfriend also stated that when she finally did talk to the now 64-year-old that night, at around 10 p.m., his first question was if the media had picked up the story of Amy's disappearance. Even though, especially back then with the lack of 24-7 media coverage, the story would not even make it to the front page of the newspapers until the next day. And there's a possibility that news of Amy's disappearance did not even hit radio or TV airwaves until at least 10.30 p.m. or maybe even 11. Police believe that this line of questioning indicated that the man may have had prior knowledge of Amy's disappearance, which would indicate a guilty conscience. When asked why he was concerned about Amy's disappearance, the man first claimed that he was friends with relatives of Amy and later claimed to have possibly spoken to Amy himself on the phone. In what some say is the most damning piece of evidence, the day that Amy was found and the location publicized, on a hunch that the killer may drive by to see the police's findings, an FBI agent was posted at the nearest intersection. The agent tasked with monitoring the street was responsible for writing down the plates of all cars who passed that area that day. The suspect accused by his ex-girlfriend was confirmed by FBI agents as having driven through that intersection on the day Amy's body was found. There was no specific reason for the man to have been in the area on that day, 50 miles away from his hometown and job, and the fact that he chose to drive by the exact location that Amy's body was publicized as having been found is highly suspicious to investigators. Just a few days after the 30th anniversary of Amy's disappearance, the suspect himself walked into a police station and willingly sat down with detectives for what would turn into a two-day interview. When police asked the suspect if he had ever contacted Amy via phone, he stated that he may have called her house after meeting her mother at a bar and could have possibly mistaken the 10-year-old for her much older mother and therefore may have conversed with her by mistake. When police asked him if he may have called Amy's house prior to that one supposedly accidental conversation, the man states that he may have called previously as a wrong number. 
how he would have been aware of the owner of the wrong number, which was supposedly accidentally dialed, is unclear. Police report that when investigators asked the suspect if Amy had ever been inside his car, he oddly replied, quote, I don't believe so. But when asked again if there was even a remote possibility that Amy would have been inside his vehicle, the man cryptically replied, quote, okay, but I don't know what the situation would have been. Police stated that two of the eyewitnesses at the square that day, children themselves and friends of Amy's, believed that the 10-year-old was talking to her father when last seen. This observation correlates with the given age of the suspect at that time. With the suspect being 64 in 2021, that means he would have been 33 at the time of the abduction, which is within the age range that would have been matched up to how a child would perceive a father of someone Amy's age. According to police, using old photos of the man, his appearance in the latter half of 1989 was, quote, consistent with one of two major suspect composites obtained via witness interviews. A sworn affidavit written by the police officer who interviewed the accused suspect in 2019 said that the suspect stated that 1989 and 1990 were, quote, dark periods in his life. When asked if there was even a remote possibility that his DNA could be found on items near the scene, such as on a curtain or a blanket, the man reportedly acquiesced and said that his DNA might be on a curtain that was found nearby. But he went on to say that if DNA did show up on her body, it would have, of course, been planted there. The suspect stopped communicating with the police the next day failing to show up to the station to sign a release which would allow police to open and search his storage unit. So detectives had to get a warrant in order to search it. While investigators reportedly seized evidence, they most likely did not seize Amy's personal belongings. As if police had anything other than circumstantial evidence, they would have arrested him by now. So remains the missing link, which could come in the form of a public tip. This man is reportedly currently homeless and living out of his car, but he does have a cell phone and possibly a storage unit. His name has not been officially released to the media. While the bounty of circumstantial evidence continues to mount, mere hunches and near impossible coincidences are not enough for a conviction. So family and police wait for a break or development in DNA technology. In 2019, possible new hope was brought to this cold case in the form of a development of a DNA technology. Dr. Ed Green of UC Santa Cruz has built a technology that was first utilized to extract DNA from fossilized bones in order to sequence his own DNA from a rootless hair of his. When he finally sequenced the genome from the rootless hair and submitted a saliva sample to compare it against, the code was the same. Which is an incredible feat, as previously only nuclear DNA, not mitochondrial DNA, could yield such a complete code, which could then be uploaded into CODIS and other databases, both private and public. Being able to identify these hairs may become the crucial key to IDing a suspect. Dr. Green, however, cautions that this technology is in its infancy and extremely expensive and therefore not able to be provided on a larger level for police use on cold cases. But hopefully, as the technology progresses and becomes more affordable, it can be utilized by Bay Village Police. Detectives go on to state that in May of 2020, two witnesses to Amy's conversation with the older male in front of Baskin Robbins picked the suspect's image out of an array of photo lineups. It is unclear if these two witnesses were the two previously young friends of Amy or different people. Amy's father, Mark, continues to hope that new evidence will lead to some answers for him and his family. Amy's mother died shortly after the murder of her daughter. Her father, so pained by the memory of wife and child, has never visited their gravesite, located at Highland Memorial Park in Wisconsin. He perhaps prefers to remember them as they were in life, happy, carefree, 
alive. Now mother and daughter repose together, eternal sleep for the eternally bonded. Items that were missing, items presumably taken from Amy all those years ago, have still not been located. And police ask anyone who may have seen those unique items attributed to Amy, including her child-sized horse riding boots or turquoise earrings in the shape of horse heads, to come forward. If you have any information about the murder of this 10-year-old girl, the FBI is offering a reward of up to $25,000. For tips leading to the arrest and conviction of her killer. Anyone with information about Amy's death is asked to call investigators at 1-877-FBI-OHIO or they can contact the Bay Village Police Department at 440-871-1234. The Lava Lake Murders Edward Nichols, 50, Roy Wilson, 35, and Edward Dewey Morris, 25, all residents of Bend, Oregon, decided to grab opportunity by its horns, or rather, its fur, when, in the fall of 1923, three men accepted a friend's offer to use a trapper's cabin in the Deschutes National Forest. These three men were going to spend the year trapping animals for their valuable fur a lucrative job for those experienced and daring enough to isolate themselves in the unforgiving wilderness in the name of the hunt and in the name of the money that came with it. A few months had passed when the eldest trapper, Edward Nichols, returned to his hometown of Bend one week prior to Christmas to sell a sleigh full of valuable furs he had trapped and treated. He boasted cheerfully to locals of the success he was having fur trapping before returning back to the cabin. Four weeks later, Alan Wilcoxon was traveling by snowshoe from his home in Fall River to the resort he owned at Elk Lake. He stopped to visit with the three men in their cabin and socialized with them throughout the evening. They were in high spirits, he recalled, as their trapping endeavors had been successful. On January 16th, Alan left the men to continue to his resort, the Elk Lake Lodge. This was the last time anyone would see the three men alive ever again. Innes Morris, brother of the youngest trapper Dewey, became worried when he heard that the mink traps set throughout the forest had not been checked on or maintained. When a search party was finally convened in April, they descended upon the cabin to find it empty. Food had burned on the stove, and it was as if the pot had been sitting over a fire for a prolonged amount of time before burning up and the fire burning out. The dinner table was set for a meal that seemingly never occurred. Rifles, traps, and heavy clothing were found in the cabin. Magazines and papers were scattered about, and the skin racks and dryers were in a neglected condition. A cat was also discovered emaciated, but still alive. The animal's condition seemed to confirm the timeline. Whatever happened had occurred months before. There were no signs that the men had prepared for a trip. More alarming than the lack of human presence was an empty fox pen that housed five valuable foxes which the men had promised to feed and take care of for Ed Logan, the owner of the cabin, in exchange for their use of the property. But the pen was empty except for a bloody claw-tipped hammer. The family and friends of the men, now highly alarmed, ventured out of the perimeter of the cabin where it was found that all the traps the men had set out were unattended. They still contained 12 trapped marten as well as four foxes and a wayward skunk. The animals had evidently been there for some time as they were shriveled and had frozen. At that point, Word reached Clarence A. Adams, the deputy Deschutes County Sheriff and game warden, and he and his team came to the cabin to assist in the search. The next day, about a quarter mile from the cabin, on the frozen snow-covered shores of Lava Lake, investigators found the men's large sleigh covered in dark brown stains, which were later revealed to be human blood stains. In the snow leading up to the lake itself, they saw red patches and what seemed to be a human molar and human hair partially thawed in the frost. 
It seemed as if a piece of ice had been cut out of the frozen lake and the bodies deposited under the layers of ice. The lake had refrozen over and snow had piled up in the depression. Looking out at the ominous frozen lake, they saw strange bulky shapes under the ice, which they were sure were their missing friends and family members. Later that evening, Innes and the sheriff went to the lake to catch some fish for supper, but when they arrived, they were surprised that the day's sun had thawed out the frozen lake partially, revealing a rowboat, which, once joined by Ed Logan, the owner of the cabin, they towed to where they thought the hole in the ice had been. There they found the men's bodies, slightly decomposed, floating in the icy waters. The rescuers sadly tied ropes to the bodies and rowed them back to the shores of the lake, where they fastened them to the snow shelf to wait out the night until the morning sun brought some more manpower and hopefully some answers. Adams, the lead investigator, donned his snowshoes and ran the distance back to town to get more help. Wrapped in muslin material, the former trappers were bloodied and brutally mutilated. It looked like whomever had committed these atrocities had tried to hack up the bodies after killing them to dispose of them, but had done so unsuccessfully. Besides many hammer indentations that covered their bodies, Edward Nichols had a shotgun blast to the jaw, which shattered it, and a revolver bullet wound to the head. Ominously, his watch had stopped at 9.10. Roy Wilson had been shot in the right shoulder and back of the head and Dewey Morris had a shotgun wound to his left shoulder and a skull fracture, seemingly from the same instrument used to bludgeon the other two men, the hammer. One man stood out as a suspect, Lee Collins. Ed Logan, the property owner, recalled Collins had trapped with Nichols, one of the deceased men, the year before, and the two had quarreled over a wallet that Nichols believed Lee Collins had stolen. Logan also recalled that this Collins fellow had explicitly told Nichols that one day he would come back and kill him. Logan recalled that Collins also went by the name Charles Kimsey. This name was familiar to law enforcement, as in 1923, Kimsey had hired a car and a driver, and then in the middle of the trip, bludgeoned the driver, bound him in wire, and threw him down a well before taking the car and continuing the trip solo. Luckily, the driver managed to survive and to tell his story. A government-employed fur trapper, Kimsey was known to be a great shot with both a revolver and a rifle. Knowing that this man was highly dangerous and possibly deranged, police issued a $1,500 reward for his capture, which is the equivalent of over $20,000 today. Later, it was revealed that several months earlier, Charles Kimsey was spotted in the nearby town of Portland, Oregon by a traffic officer when Kimsey approached him and asked where he could sell his sack of furs. The officer directed him to the Shoemaker Fur Company, where Kimsey sold several furs to owner Carl Shoemaker for $110 cash, the equivalent of about $1,500 today. After going through his records, Shoemaker told police that the seller had noted his name as Ed Nichols. It had been on January 22nd, just a week after Wilcoxon had seen the trappers alive. Whoever sold these furs had used Nichols' trapper's license and was the man responsible for the triple killing. Police and the public searched diligently for Kimsey for four years until the case went cold and was thought of only by friends, family, and those close to the investigation. That was until nine years after the crime, when, in February of 1933, a jail warden was walking down the street when he walked right past Kimsey, whom he recognized immediately. Officers were dispatched and Kimsey was arrested without incident. He denied the crime and produced an alibi, claiming he had spent the winter of 1923-24 to in Colorado working on the Moffat Tunnel. He even ate his Christmas dinner there, he said, right inside the tunnel. When Kimsey's employment with Moffat was confirmed, Macaulay and his staff scrambled to round up other evidence, still utterly convinced they had their suspect. However, the case fell apart when Shoemaker refused to definitely identify Kimsey, as, after a lapse of nine years, Kimsey had aged considerably since he last saw him and had grown quite bald. Shoemaker stated that a man's life was too great a thing to place in jeopardy if he wasn't absolutely certain. 
The traffic policeman also refused to definitely identify Kimsey. But while he was never tried for the Lava Lake murders, despite all evidence pointing to him, Kimsey ended up being charged with the attempted murder of the car driver, who was able to positively identify him, and Kimsey was sentenced to life in prison. Bryce Laspisa. Bryce Laspisa was born on April 30th, 1994, and raised by his loving parents, Karen and Michael Laspisa in Illinois. Growing up, he attended Kingsley Elementary School, Lincoln Junior High School, and graduated from Naperville Central High School in 2012. Bryce was described by his family and friends as a happy and funny guy who would light up the room whenever he walked in. He was a talented artist, a good student, and played football and baseball. Shortly after Bryce's graduation, Michael and Karen retired and decided to move from their home in Illinois to Laguna Niguel, California. Bryce would apply for and was accepted into Sierra College, a community college in Rockland, California that was located seven hours away from his parents' home in Laguna Niguel. To start his college experience, he moved to Rockland, where he was about to start his freshman year of study. Bryce chose to study graphic and industrial design. Everything seemed to be going well for Bryce in Rockland. He had a great freshman year at the college. He made a few friends and was good friends with his roommate, Sean Dixon. He had also started dating a girl named Kim Sly. During the summer break, Bryce spent some time with his parents in Laguna Niguel. His family said that he was happy and was looking forward to returning to college to resume his classes. Bryce would return to college for his sophomore year a few weeks before his class would start. Something would change for Bryce after his return from summer break, though. Bryce's friends began to notice a shift in his behavior. His roommate, Sean, reported that Bryce had been acting strange. He had been heavily drinking since his return and said that on weekends he would finish two-fifths of hard alcohol by himself. On August 26, 2013, Bryce attended his first round of classes and later called his mother, Karen, to tell her that it went well. His mother said that nothing seemed to be out of place and said that they had a good, normal conversation. The next day, on the 27th of August, Bryce started to act extremely strange and admitted to his girlfriend, Kim, that he had been taking ADHD medication that was not prescribed to him. Sean said that Bryce had been taking Vyvanse to help him stay awake to play video games all night. Later in the day, Bryce gave away some of his belongings to his friends, including diamond earrings gifted to him by his mother and his precious Xbox. Later that night, Bryce also broke up with his girlfriend over text, saying that she would be better off without him. The next day, on the 28th of August, Sean called Bryce's mother and told her that Bryce was acting strange and that he was very concerned about him. He also said that Bryce indicated that something was troubling him but never explained what it was. That day, Bryce went to Kim's apartment in Chico, which was about a two hours drive from his apartment. At 10 p.m., Bryce called his mother and told her that Kim wouldn't give him back his car keys and that she wouldn't let him leave. Kim spoke to Karen on the phone and told her that Bryce was acting strange and she didn't think he should be driving in this condition. Karen then talked to Bryce and offered to fly out to see him the next day, to which Bryce responded, quote, No, don't make an airline reservation until I talk to you because I have a lot to talk to you about. He insisted that he was fine. Karen asked Kim to return him his car keys, but only if he promised to call her in the morning. Bryce left Kim's apartment around 11.30 p.m. At 1 a.m. on August 29th, Bryce called Karen and she missed the call. When Karen saw the missed call, she assumed that Bryce had called her to let her know that he had made it to his apartment safely. She would find out later in the investigation that cell towers placed him one hour away from his apartment in an isolated area when he had made that call. Later in the morning, at around 11 a.m., Bryce's parents received a voicemail from their auto insurance company stating that Bryce had used their roadside assistance plan at 9 a.m. His parents tried calling Bryce, but he didn't pick up his phone. Concerned, they called Bryce's roommate, Sean, who told them that Bryce never came home the previous night. His parents then checked and found out that Bryce had charged $20 worth of fuel on their credit card from Castro Tire and Truck in Button Willow, California. Button Willow is about three hours away from his parents' house in Laguna Niguel, so Karen and Michael assumed that Bryce was on his way to visit them. They called Bryce several times, but he didn't pick up his phone. Since Bryce bought gas around 9 a.m. and Laguna Niguel was only three hours away, Karen and Michael became concerned when he did not arrive back home by 12 p.m. 
Karen called the Castro Tire and Truck and talked to a man named Christian. Christian told her that Bryce had run out of gas and he was called to deliver him about three gallons of gas. Karen told Christian that Bryce wasn't answering his phone and that she was very concerned for him. Christian offered to go back and see if he could find Bryce in the area. When Christian arrived, to his surprise, he found Bryce still sitting in his car, in the exact same spot where he had left him hours earlier. Around 12.30 p.m., Christian called Karen and told her Bryce seemed okay, though his eyes were a bit red. Christian put Bryce on the phone, who told his mother that nothing was wrong. Karen told Bryce to come home, to which he agreed and hung up the phone. His parents expected Bryce to be home by 3 p.m., however, he never showed up. They tried calling him multiple times, but he didn't pick up any of the calls. Around 6 p.m., his parents filed a missing persons report with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. The police pinged Bryce's phone and found out that he was still in Buttonwillow. Moreover, in the last nine hours, he had only moved eight miles from where he was previously found. Soon, police in the area found him sitting in his car on the side of the road on Lagoon Drive in Buttonwillow. The police searched his car for drugs, but did not find anything. The police did a sobriety test, which he passed. When the police asked him what he was doing, he said that he was just blowing off some steam. The police spent 20 minutes talking to Bryce, and to them, he seemed completely fine. He was talkative and was replying to questions normally. The officers asked him to call his parents as they were very worried, but to their dismay, Bryce was reluctant. The police then dialed Bryce's parents for him and put him on the phone. Karen asked Bryce what he was doing. Bryce simply said that he was putting stuff back in his car after the search. Karen again said, What are you doing? You've been in the same area for more than nine hours. Get some food and come home. Some sources claim that Bryce had said that he was going to hang out with friends later. That would explain why he was in Buttonwillow for so long. But who these friends were has never been identified. Karen asked the officers if Bryce was okay to drive, and they said he was perfectly fine. The officers left him to make his way home. Later that evening, Christian, from Castro Tire and Truck, called Karen after seeing a missed call from her a few hours prior. Karen explained the situation to him. Christian offered to go check on Bryce again, but Karen told him he didn't have to as Bryce was most likely on his way home by now. Christian went to check anyway. When he arrived to the area where Bryce was last seen, he found Bryce in the same spot, sitting in his car. Christian offered to follow Bryce until he was on the freeway on his way home. After 30 minutes, Christian left Bryce on the freeway and headed back. He told Karen that Bryce was on his way home now. Over the next couple of hours, Bryce and his parents exchanged several phone calls. Karen asked him to name any landmarks or street signs he saw. He said he didn't see any, but said that his GPS said he would be home by 3.25 a.m. At around 2 a.m., Bryce called Karen and told her that he was too tired to keep driving and that he was going to pull over, sleep for a couple of hours, and then get back on the road. At this point, Bryce had been awake for a minimum of 24 hours. His parents agreed that he should pull over and get some sleep. This would be the last time they would hear from him. That morning at 8 a.m., the Las Pisa family's doorbell rang. Bryce's parents expected it to be Bryce, but when they opened the door, they found a California Highway Patrol officer standing in front of them. The officer asked whether they owned a 2003 beige Toyota Highlander. The Las Pisas told the officer that their son had been driving that car. The officer informed them that at 5.30 a.m. that morning, the vehicle had been found overturned and abandoned in Castaic Lake off an access road to the state recreation area about two hours north of the family's home. He told them the vehicle had been crashed and was found on its side at the bottom of a 25-foot embankment at the base of a steep hill. He also said that the back window of the car had been broken from the inside and they believed that Bryce was inside the vehicle at the time of the crash and pushed his way out of the car. His laptop and phone were found in the car, while his duffel bag and wallet were outside, near the rear window. Only small amounts of Bryce's blood were found on the passenger side headrest and in the back seat, suggesting that Bryce wasn't seriously injured. An examination of the crime scene suggested that, for unknown reasons, Bryce drove off the service road into a rest area, along a cell tower, and toward the lake. The cell tower is at the top of the embankment, and there were tire marks from the cell tower to the bottom of the embankment where the vehicle was found. Investigating the tire tracks and the area, police were able to assume that, while going down the embankment, Bryce had accelerated and sped up instead of hitting the brakes. 
This suggested to investigators that Bryce may have been wanting to take his own life by driving his car into the Castaic Lake, but the vehicle flipped before it could reach the lake. Police conducted a large-scale investigation of the area, consisting of hundreds of volunteers, helicopters, divers, and ATVs, but no sign of Bryce would turn up. Then, on September 4th, 2013, a jogger called 911 to report a brush fire just three miles from where Bryce's car was found. When the firefighters arrived at the scene, they discovered the cause of the fire to be a burning body. However, the body was later determined to be of an LA man who had been a victim of a homicide. On the ninth day of the search, bloodhounds were brought in and they tracked Bryce's scent from the car, over a road, and toward a truck stop, but this is where the scent ended. Police obtained some CCTV images from the area. The still images taken from the camera showed Bryce's car going up the hill at 2.15 a.m., just six minutes after he told his mother he was too tired and was going to pull over and sleep. However, just one hour before his crashed car was found, at 4.29 a.m., the same camera on the same hill captured a picture of Bryce's car going back up the hill again. No one knows what Bryce was doing in that area. After weeks of exhaustive searching, the search was called off. According to investigators, there is no evidence to suggest that foul play was involved or that Bryce had died of suicide. Police talked to Kim, Sean, and his friends. They found out that the same night that Bryce had left, he had sent Sean a text message that read, quote, I love you, bro. Seriously, you're the best person I've ever met and you've saved my soul. While being interviewed, Sean said that he really didn't think Bryce was leaving forever. Investigators believe that Bryce willingly walked away from his current life, but his family does not agree with this, stating that they were very close and that there is just no way Bryce would leave them without contact for seven years. In the years following, Bryce's parents have continued to search for their missing son. In 2015, they hired a sonar boat and searched the lake for two days. However, nothing would turn up. Bryce has been missing for more than seven years now, and with no leads and no signs, Bryce's case remains unsolved. Polly Hanna Class On October 1st, 1993, Polly Hanna Class, a resident of 4th Street in Petaluma, California, along with two female friends, were participating in a time-honored tradition amongst preteens, the sleepover. What should have been a safe night turned to chaos when a man broke into the house wielding a knife while Polly's mother slept. Unbeknownst to Polly and her friends as they tried on Halloween costumes, a man was standing outside her bedroom door, listening. Between 10.30 and 11 p.m., when Polly opened the door to get more supplies for the party, all three girls saw a tall, dark figure standing in the doorway, knife and duffel bag in hand. As the man walked into the room, the girls fixated on the long knife with a wooden handle, which he threatened them with, and asked, Who lives here? To which Polly replied, I do. The intruder's knife kept the girls quiet as he used strips of fabric and Nintendo cords to bind their wrists and ankles. After binding all three terrified girls by the hands and feet and putting pillowcases over their heads, he told the two guests to count to a thousand as he took Polly, who was sobbing, and forced her into his car. The girls waited until they heard the closing of the front door, and then they frantically began trying to untie themselves by standing back to back and fumbling at each other's bindings. But when that didn't work, one girl was able to bring her hands underneath her legs and step through the ties around her arms, bringing her hands to the front and enabling her to untie herself and then the other girl. Once free, the two ran to Polly's sleeping mother. Eve Nichols, who was promptly awakened by screams of, Polly's gone. Polly's mother promptly called police at 11.03. During questioning, the lead officer in charge had to briefly consider that the two girls were making this whole story up as some type of elaborate teenage prank. But the girls' vehemence and raw panic convinced him otherwise. The FBI was quickly called to help investigate, and the Petaluma Police Department sent out an alert to all surrounding departments. Upon canvassing, a neighbor told police that around 10.30 that night, a man had nonchalantly walked up the driveway and casually opened the front door to Polly's home. 
By the mannerisms of the man, who seemed so relaxed and at home, the neighbor assumed he was someone who was either staying at the house or who knew the family and did not raise any sort of alarm. Little did the neighbor know that he had witnessed Polly's abductor right before her kidnapping. Because of the casual manner in which the neighbor recalled the man walking into the house, police briefly considered whether or not it had been Polly's father who had taken her. Polly's parents were divorced, and because most child abductions involve someone close to the child, police briefly consider the father, Mark Klass, who lived in neighboring Sausalito, as a suspect, but after more investigation and the administration of a polygraph test, he was cleared of any suspicion and the investigation focused on a stranger abduction, which statistically did not bode well for Polly, as 75% of stranger abductions end in murder. Upon careful and tedious crime scene analysis, police found a palm print on the bunk bed frame in Polly's room. The palm print is not a match to any family members or visitors to the home. Unlike fingerprints, there was no database for palm prints, so the function of the print would only serve to match to an existing suspect. While police were analyzing the crime scene for any details, investigators were diligently interviewing the two young witnesses to Polly's kidnapping. They utilized a sketch artist to draw what the girls remembered about the man. The girls recalled he was white, had a yellow bandana around his head, and had facial hair. Thanks to the avant-garde techniques of two concerned and computer-literate Petaluma residents, Gary French and Bill Rhodes, along with journalist Larry Magid, Polly's case was the first missing persons case to utilize the internet as a means of spreading awareness. Although the World Wide Web was very much in its infancy, Polly's missing poster was shared with those savvy enough to be online in 1993 and was downloaded not only in numerous states throughout the U.S., but also in countries across the world, making Polly's case the first missing child's case to go viral. In all, Polly's image was shared digitally more than two billion times. Besides the internet, more classic methods of raising awareness and cultivating resources was utilized, such as the posting of flyers around town, the passing out of pre-recorded tapes playing information about Polly, the faxing of flyers to local stores and supermarkets for distribution, and the passing out of t-shirts with Polly's image on it, and even the stuffing of flyers into the bottoms of boxes of Bio Bottoms kids' clothes, of which Polly's mother was a sales manager. Over 8 million pieces of paper printed with Polly's image and information were dispersed across the world, in places as far flung as Kathmandu. The general hope of the almost 4,000 volunteers participating in the search was that high visibility would mean that Polly and her abductor could not travel freely. But, as it turned out, the culprit and his innocent victim had been in Petaluma's backyard the entire time. Over 4,000 volunteers assisted in the search for Polly, covering over 1,000 miles of fields, meadows, apple orchards, and redwood preserves. Additionally, air support was brought in, and helicopters and airplanes searched 3,000 square miles of land for any signs of a girl who is now on the forefront of everyone's mind. The Petaluma community came together and created the Poly Class Search Center, a one-stop shop that would enable the volunteers to organize and methodically spread the word. This unified system of volunteers, the media, the community members, and the families of victims working in tandem helped to form a model of how missing children searches should be enacted in the future, instead of in the disjointed manner in which they were currently conducted in 1993. The Poly Class Search Center eventually would field calls from other parents of missing children and would assist in the ensuing search and media blitz needed to find a missing child. Winona Ryder, a well-known film actress who was originally from Petaluma, offered a $200,000 reward for any information that successfully helped bring Class home. Then, one day, there was seemingly a break in the case. Mark Class's brother-in-law was watching the home of Polly's father when a call came in. The voice on the other end of the line was purporting to be Polly and claimed she was being held in a hotel room. The voice claimed that someone was keeping her there and that they had stepped out but would be back soon. Then the line disconnected. Frantic, Polly's uncle called police who quickly mobilized to put a tap on the phone. Soon, another call came in, similar to the first. It was traced to Hayward, a city close by in the East Bay. 
But when police arrived at the Chase location, they found it to be not a hotel, but a middle-class home with a teenage girl living in it. She claimed to have been dared to make these prank phone calls, and family members were devastated to learn it had all been a sick hoax. Three weeks after the abduction, on October 19th, police got a call from a man claiming to have Polly and asking for ransom money. Because police phones are automatically tapped, authorities were able to get the offender's location almost instantly, but found it was just another hoax. This one bore not of a teenage prank, but very adult greed and stupidity. The man had hoped to extort money from the police without much forethought into the process, and he was swiftly arrested. Soon after, Vallejo police contacted Petaluma police with a potential suspect. He was caught breaking into the home of a single mother of a 12-year-old girl and had with him a knife and what they called a rape kit. He became a central suspect due to the similarities in circumstances, but no evidence was able to link him to the crime. In the course of the investigation, Petaluma police received a tip that Polly might be held at a cabin deep in the woods in Northern California. The Petaluma PD went to a cabin in Mendocino County on a tip from a confidential FBI informant who claimed Polly was being held captive by drug dealers in some sort of revenge kidnapping. But as SWAT teams descended upon the cabin in the dead of night, the head of the Petaluma Police Department task force received a call from the FBI agent in charge of handling the confidential informant and was told that the entire thing had been made up. The mission was aborted and the police were back to square one. Then, on November 28th, finally, after so many false leads and false hope, Dana Jaffe, a woman who had previously called police about a suspicious man on her property the night of Polly's kidnapping, and who lived on Pythian Road in Santa Rosa, about 25 miles north of Petaluma, called police for the second time in two months. This time, she was walking around her property after loggers had cleared some trees of hers when she came upon a collection of items which raised her suspicions. They looked like bindings that had been used to tie someone up. Police dispatch sent out Detective Larry Pelton, who had been present in the bedroom crime scene of the kidnapping, and he was called to investigate the Jaffe property. He discovered strips of white cloth, which he instantly recognized as matching the cloth that the two girls were tied up with. This discovery prompted police to look further into Dana's prior call, which had come the same night as the kidnapping, almost two months before. Two months prior, about one hour after Polly was abducted, a resident of Oakmont Village in Santa Rosa, a town about 25 miles away from Petaluma, had just come home from work and relieved her nanny of her duties. Dana Jaffe's nanny was leaving for the night when she saw a strange man standing on the private road that leads to the Jaffe house on the inside of the fenced-off property. Terrified, she quickly drove to a nearby gas station and called Dana to tell her that a terrifying-looking man was on the inside of the perimeter of her property and to get out as fast as she could. Dana threw both of her kids into the car and promptly drove off the property to call police in safety. When the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department responded to Dana's call, they found a man named Richard Allen Davis standing next to his rusty Ford Pinto, which had run off into a ditch. Davis was sweaty, short of breath, and had leaves and twigs in his hair. Deputies were unable to see that Davis matched the description of the kidnapper as described on the teletype about one hour prior because they never even heard the broadcast as it was not shared with their individual radios by the Sheriff's Department. Davis claimed he was merely sightseeing and had gotten lost and distracted and run into the ditch. The officers bought the story after running his name, and seeing no outstanding warrants and briefly searching the car, they let him go. Even though they had found an open bottle of beer, they did not arrest him for driving under the influence as they had technically not caught him driving. He was standing next to his car. The officers were not even aware that a neighboring county was on the search for a 12-year-old kidnapping victim because they were on a different radio system. In 1993, there was no such thing as an Amber Alert, so the officers had no way of knowing of the emerging case. Based on the evidence, it is supposed that by the time Davis was being questioned by police next to his car, Polly was already dead and Richard was coming back to collect her body, but had broken down prior to reaching his goal. 
Because of the lack of cross-county communication, the officers had no reason to check the priors, or they would have realized that they were talking to a suspicious man who had been convicted of kidnapping twice before. Davis was let go after the property owner decided not to press charges. His car was towed. Police made the man swear to never go on Dana Jaffe's property again, and then released him next to the highway. Two months later, this late-night call would become contextualized upon the finding of torn fabric used to bind the girls and the discovery of torn ballet tights which matched items from Polly's room. With this new information in hand, police revisited the call made the night of October 2nd and found the name and driver's license photo of the man they had stopped that night. The resemblance of Richard Allen Davis's features to that of the sketch provided by Polly's friends was noticeable almost instantly. Richard Allen Davis, who had been convicted of kidnapping twice before, had actually been in the presence and in the hands of police two times in the past two months. Once when they stopped him on Jaffe's property the night of Polly's abduction, and a second time a few weeks later, on October 19th. On October 19th, Davis was pulled over in Ukiah and arrested for driving under the influence. He was booked into the county jail where they had police sketches of the suspected kidnapper on the actual walls of the jail but no one noticed the resemblance or questioned Davis's past crimes. In 1976, Davis had kidnapped a woman and sexually assaulted her. He claimed he was hearing voices and had heard the disembodied voice of a dead girlfriend postulating on what it was like to be raped. He served five years for this crime. Then, in 1984, he abducted another woman and stole $6,000 from her. He served eight years for this second felony and was paroled in June of 1993, just four months before Polly was abducted. Upon realizing the connection, police began intense surveillance of Davis. After surveilling him for two days and finding no new evidence, they decided to move in and arrest him. Police went to the home of Davis's sister in Ukiah, where, after questioning the sister and searching the home for Polly, they set up a perimeter and ended up catching Richard as he tried to get back onto the property. A low-key and calm arrest was made, but Richard insisted he knew nothing about Polly. However, after obtaining a copy of his handprints, the crime lab was able to say that the palm print left at the scene of the crime was in fact a match to that of Richard Davis, and police breathed the sigh of relief as they finally are given a break in the case. However, their relief was short-lived, because even though the palm print left conclusively proved Richard's presence, the police couldn't feel any joy until they found Polly. Initially, Richard insisted that the police had no proof that he had ever been in Polly's house and denied any knowledge of the crime. But when presented with a copy of the palm print analysis, he quickly changed his story and confessed. It is in his confession that police learned their greatest fears had been confirmed. Polly had been killed. Four days after his arrest, and after an exhaustive search of the scene on Pythian Road and the surrounding property, which spanned for four days, Richard finally confessed to strangling Polly the night of October 1st, and eventually led police to Polly's makeshift burial location off of Highway 101 near Cloverdale. Detectives noted that Davis casually smoked a cigarette as he told investigators to go towards the right of a fallen tree. There they would uncover the unrecognizable remains of 12-year-old Polly Class, thus ending the search in the most tragic way possible. It turns out that in the early hours of October 2nd, when officers received a call of a strange man trespassing on a private road, Polly was probably already dead. Although Davis would not give an exact timeline of events, based on his limited conversations with police and in conjunction with the evidence collected, detectives believe that Polly was attacked and killed near Dana Jaffe's property prior to deputies stopping Davis and towing his car. Prosecutors surmise that Davis hid Polly's body in some bushes and then was stopped by police before he could move her to her final resting place, a grave location police believe he had already picked out. Upon hearing the news that Polly had been found deceased, Polly's father, Mark, sat by the fire and simply sobbed. The search was over, the truth was out, hope was gone. Eve Nichols, Polly's mother, had kept a candle lit in the window of Polly's home in hopes she would come back, but after hearing the tragic news from officers, she went and gut-wrenchingly blew the candle out. 
Prosecutors claim that this was a premeditated crime. They claim Richard had stalked Polly for weeks prior to the abduction. The state also alleges that in addition to the kidnapping, Davis attempted a lewd act on Polly. Prosecutors allege that after the lewd act was performed, that Davis killed Polly. On June 18, 1996, Davis was convicted of kidnapping, lewd acts, and first-degree murder. Upon hearing his death sentence, Davis turned to the jury and eerily winked, blew a kiss, and then flipped them off with both hands. In the sentencing proceedings, the presiding judge, after sentencing Davis to die of lethal injection, said, quote, It is very easy for me to pronounce this sentence, given your revolting behavior in this courtroom. Davis is currently an inmate of San Quentin State Prison in Marin, just 25 miles from Polly's family home. He continues to enact appeals and is locked in solitary confinement after an intentional drug overdose, as well as numerous attacks by other inmates. Winona Ryder, who was an active advocate for Polly's family during the search, dedicated her role as Joe in the feature film Little Woman to Polly's life and memory. Because of the tragedy of the lack of communication on the night of Polly's kidnapping, the California Highway Patrol changed the manner in which it broadcasts alerts. Whereas before counties had separate systems, now such alerts as kidnapping are broadcast statewide on a centralized system. Polly's case also led to the enacting of the Three Strikes Law, which mandates life in prison for lifetime criminals like Davis, convicted of three separate felonies. In honor of her beautiful life and memory, Polly's Mark established the Class Kids Foundation, which is dedicated to finding missing children and helping those affected by crimes against children.